Hello and welcome to another episode on the White Dog Garage YouTube channel. My name is Bob. In this episode I am going to show you a benchtop English wheel that I bought recently. Put it through its paces and in case you're interested in that sort of thing yourself. This is it here. The model is EWBT40. It's sold in Australia by Hare and Forbes machinery house. See that somewhere? <laughs> Look, as per usual, I am not sponsored at all by Heron Forbes. Uh, it just happens to be one of the companies that I buy stuff from. Uh, they make no contribution to the channel. Uh, I've paid my own money for this, uh, so you're going to be hearing about the machine from my point of view, not their point of view. Looking around on YouTube, most of the English wheel videos are about the big floor mounted ones. Uh, very little, not quite nothing at all, but very little on uh, bench top units. So I thought I would make this video, particularly if you're in Australia and you're thinking about buying this particular model. Metal shaping has been a long term interest of mine and over the years I've got pretty handy with a planishing hammer and a dolly. But I thought an English wheel would be a useful addition to my metal shaping tool set. The bench top models were of interest to me for a number of factors. So the first one was cost. I didn't want to spend a lot of money on something that I might not use that often. So these are about half the price of the smallest floor mounted one so I thought that was a reasonable place to start. The next factor that suited me is that it has a small but workable size and it takes up no floor space and in a small shop like I have here that is a critical factor. I didn't need another freestanding tool if I could help it. My focus at this point in my life is making small or metal shaping small parts, small pieces. And as I understand it, these benchtop models are meant for exactly that. So from my point of view, uh, to make small bezels etc, it would be a useful addition, whereas a bigger unit would take up a lot of space, be in the way and be overkill for what I want to do. Now being a bench top model, well we're sitting on the bench here but it can also be mounted in a vise. It's just a matter of picking it up. <coughs> now you can pick it up, it's not that heavy. And you can put it in the vise which secures it in place very handy. In fact, I've got it here for demonstration but uh, I've been playing with it over the last week or so since I bought it and I've been doing it mainly on the bench here. So in the end I thought I'd make this video because it might be useful to somebody who's in the same position, not a lot of space, not making really big parts and just wanted to make a start on having an English wheel. Hare and Forbes sell quite a range of English wheels and this is the smallest one and they go up from there. There are some critical factors as to how you might make your decision as to which size suits you and I'll go into some of those. This unit, the EWBT40, comes in a flat pack with some assembly required, not a great deal. Uh, the bigger ones also come in flat packs with some assembly required. Uh, probably appreciated from the manufacturer's point of view that uh, yeah, you're paying for space and weight when you're shipping. If you can get it into a flat pack then it's much easier, cheaper to ship. This bench top English wheel comes neatly packed in a box which weighs in at about 35 kilograms or about 77 pounds.
Inside the box is the frame, which is already bolted together, support feet and anvil racks, which need to be fixed to the frame, along with the wheel and anvils, along with their respective axles. Also included is two Allen or hex keys to use in assembling the unit. The screws that attach the support feet and the racks are already partway screwed into the frame and need to be removed and refitted to fix those attachments in place. I found it easier to use a longer hex or allen key for the support feet screws. I also found a T-bar hex or allen key provided easier access for refitting the anvil rack screws. The wheel is a snug fit in its yoke, after all. You don't want any side movement of it when it's in use. And I found loosening the front plate made it just that bit easier to fit. Our clip is fitted to the end of the rolling wheel shaft to prevent it coming out in use. The anvils are secured on either side with external circlips or snap rings. The wheel and the anvils are fitted with sealed bearings. Their axles are a tight fit, which is good in a way. Although, I did find myself making use of the press and a nylon hammer during their fitting. This is the fully assembled benchtop English wheel. Except for a nylon hammer and a press, these are the tools that I use to assemble the unit. Let's talk about design and specification. The top wheel is called the rolling wheel. It has a flat surface. Uh, with the bigger ones, it's bigger and wider. The bottom wheel is called the anvil wheel, or typically the anvil. This one's called the wheel. So the top one is called the rolling wheel, or the wheel. Uh, this is uh, about 6 inches in diameter, but they get bigger with the bigger units, uh, and they also get wider. This one's uh, 25 millimeters, or about an inch wide. The bottom wheel is called the anvil wheel or just the anvil. And the other thing that you need to consider is uh, the throat, which is the distance from here to there essentially. In this one's case it's 400 millimeters, 40 centimeters if you like. Uh, what it means is that the effective size of something that you can roll or wheel is about 800 millimeters because you can change sides but with the distance there and movement of things really the effect of size would be about 750 millimeters about 30 inches that you could do with a part and that plays a part with the bigger ones as to how 
bigger a part you can do. Uh, certainly for me, what I foresee my use for this machine, uh, that throat distance is more than enough. The other factor you need to consider in getting an English wheel is the rigidity of the frame. This frame is just essentially two 8mm plates joined together by steel spacers. In the use that I put it through over the last week or so, um, I don't see any flex in the frame. But I guess you get into bigger parts and the bigger units and I understand there can be some flex in the frame and you, you will see uh, people that have just taken the anvils and the wheel and built their own frame or have taken the frame they, they got and just put gussets etc in to just strengthen it up. Something to bear in mind because the last thing you want is when you're putting pressure on the part is to have the C-section if you like open up and you're not getting the crush on the part. So the wheel has a flat surface but the anvil in general has a dome surface and the dome surface has is set to a radius. So in with this particular model the biggest radius that the dome is set to is about 300 and something on millimeters and the smallest one is about uh, 12, 13 millimeters. I find living in Australia which is a metric country um, most of the tools we get these days come from China or Taiwan and what that means is that um, most of the stuff is made for the American market it's made to imperial measurements and they keep the Australians happy uh, with metric equivalents so what that means is that the anvils are marked with their radius and this one is marked with 12 and it's a 12 inch radius and the smallest one is marked with 0.5 some of the bigger units have uh, a flat anvil as well and probably talk about that a bit later I think that's more for just putting a curve on your sheet metal not so much putting a shape there well it's a shape I suppose the curve but not what it's really intended to so the point of the curve on the anvil is that what's happening with the English wheel is that you can use it to shape a piece of metal and it does this by stretching it and how it stretches it is it crushes the metal between the flat upper wheel and the dome of the anvil and metal doesn't evaporate the metal gets pushed to the side and that effectively stretches it and I'll show you shortly but it effectively domes the piece of metal that you're wheeling but English wheels can be used for I guess three operations one is the shaping the doming of the metal of stretching the metal so essentially stretching the other one is planishing so essentially making smooth a ripple surface and I can tell you with these two it takes an awful long time to make smooth a ripple surface and I'm hoping that the English wheel will make that a bit quicker and a bit easier. The final thing that you can do is you can just roll a surface. I would think that uh, if you think about a car door, certainly an older car door, and the roll of the surface as it goes to the window sill, and you might want to roll that in, you don't want any stretch as such, you just want the metal to roll over and I would see it being used for that as well. When you're selecting an English wheel key factors you need to look at 
is the hardness of the wheel, hardness of the anvil, and how smooth or polished the wheel is. Because the last thing you want is for the wheel and the anvil, particularly the wheel, which is the upper surface, the exposed surface of the metal when you finish, particularly the wheel uh, putting um, marks into the surface of the metal that you're using. Probably a big factor with aluminium, um, probably less so with steel. Now where I've worked on aluminium fuel tanks, uh, they've always been painted. If it's going to be painted, of course, filler is your friend. <laughs> and with steel, it's invariably painted. The advertising brochure for this unit specifies its capacity. Only capacity it specified is one millimeter, 20 gauge, in mild steel. When I looked at the specifications online, and the design and that, and I thought to myself, hmm, that's interesting. Because the bigger units have the same hardness in their wheels and anvils, but their capacity is rated at 1.6 millimeters. And I must confess, I couldn't for the life of me see how you could downgrade it for the smaller machine. Because really it's about the amount of pressure you've got, and that doesn't really change with thickness. Before I bought the machine, I, we have a Hare and Forbes um, showroom here in Brisbane. I went and looked at one and, and lo and behold, in the, uh, the manufacturer's plate on the machine is the capacity. And it's 1.6 millimeters. So I gather that would probably be a misprint in the advertising material because it can certainly rate it to do 1.6 millimeters. I'm going to give you a bit of a demonstration on what this benchtop one can do. I've cut some sheets of metal. Uh, this one's one millimeter thick. Uh, this is about 20 gauge in old money. And I've got another piece here which is 1.6 millimeters thick. Oh, it's about 16 gauge. In the old now, there's a couple of things I should just make a quick point about. Uh, it's always useful to wear gloves. You'd be surprised how well this stuff can cut you. Uh, the other thing is you should always cut the sheet that you're going to make or form oversize. You want an edge to it that you don't use. When I first started I'd often have pretty exact size and then you get to the end and it's shortened up. You'd be surprised how much metal you can lose in bends and twists and whatnot. So it was always good to have a little extra. But also the thing is uh, you don't want to roll to the edge. So the way you do this is you start with your biggest radius as a rule. And so I've started with the 12 inch radius with the 300 odd millimeter one. You wind your yoke up till you've got it reasonably firm but not sort of really twisted in. About there. And then the action of rolling. So you roll, and you roll in parallel lines, slightly overlapping. You can do a slight move to one side, which is what I tend to do, and which you'd probably just aim it at the end. And you just work your way across. Give it a bit more tightening. 
and work our way back. I'll just release it and just show, and I'm sure you can see there, uh, I haven't done this section, I haven't done this section, try not to get too much shine on it, but you can see the series of lines. So the object is, is to track across, trying to have them reasonably parallel, trying to have them overlapping. I can actually feel, as I come to the end of the run, I can feel that I've hit a thicker section. So even now, I'm getting a slight spreading of the metal. So the action is parallel line, move it over slightly, 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 and so on. Now I'm not sure that you believe there's a, a bow in that. I can see it, but possibly you can't. You can actually see that the middle has developed quite a dish in it and this is the action of the English wheel spreading the metal. The metal's got to go somewhere so it ends up going up in the, uh, the air. Depending on what you wanted to achieve you would go to successively smaller anvils which would give you more dishing of the surface but just to show you I'm going to move on to this uh, 1.6 millimeter 16 gauge uh, thereabouts uh, material here uh, essentially executing the same process of tracking Each time I tighten the anvil up a bit more and once again when I touch those edges I can actually feel the resistance change in the wheel as it hits the edge which is thicker now than the tracked centre. Once again, uh, depending on the angle, you can see some track marks. And once again, it's starting to bow ever so slightly in the middle. Being 1.6, it'll take a bit more time than the 1mm material. So I was also going to show you a bit of planishing. To do that, I need to make a few dents. So I'm going to take the one that I've already been rolling and uh, give it a few dents. I'm just going to do that on the sandbag here and just with the plastic mallet. You can use a ball peen. I started off, I used to do my shaping with just a steel ball peen and a um, grooved out piece of timber. I then moved up a step. I've seen the plastic mallets. A little 
shaped ones and uh, the sandbags at um, Hare and Forbes. These actually came from the United States about um, maybe 15 years ago, inspired by what I'd seen on probably American Hot Rod or something like that, maybe Jay Leno's Garage. I saw these being used and I thought, oh, that's a neat trick. And um, I bought them and uh, bought them back in my bag. Uh, didn't bring the sand, I got that here in Australia. Now, So what we got is a lot of dimples and we're going to smooth these out just using the English wheel, just using the benchtop English wheel. Now it's a similar, similar process, once again you are just rolling it but this time you're rolling out the dimples. Starts off a little bit coarser than it was. Let's bring it up for the anvil to meet. And with some difficulty, you roll it across. Again, you're tracking. You don't want it too tight to begin with. And sometimes it prays to just run it backwards and forwards for a little while until most of the lumps and bumps have gone away. And again, adjusting the anvil yoke up, and the anvil, of course. It gets pretty rickety. This is where you really need to uh, tie the English wheel down. Um, I've got it bolted here to the uh, fixture bench, the welding bench, but you might want to be putting it in your vise at that stage. And if you look here, the dimples aren't gone, but it's certainly got a lot of the dimples out. You can see the back of them here. So uh, just a little more and it should be reasonably smooth. It's probably at this stage I should make the point that some of the big machines have a quick release on the anvil yoke and what that means is that uh, it drops the anvil down, so it's a little lever, just a uh, cam, drops the anvil down, you can release the part and check it for whatever you're checking for and then put it in and pull the lever back and you're still at the same pressure that you had before you took it out. Uh, in my case, I've just got a guess. Um, I guess that's one of the things that the lower end machines don't have. So I'll put it in and I'll do up the anvil, tighten up the anvil and then proceed once again to planish the surface. Thank you. 
it's a little bit more tricky when you've got the dimples to just get a, a good roll. It's never until you get it really smooth, it never goes neatly. And with one as deep as I've made it here, you're probably looking to go to anvils of a smaller radius. I think you can see it's pretty smooth now from its earlier very dimpled appearance. So you can use the English wheel to roll a cylindrical shape just using my test piece here. What you would do is you would keep the pressure on your back side of it and you would you'd be using your biggest radius anvil or as I've mentioned before the bigger models sold by here and Forbes have a flat anvil or some of them have a flat anvil included so you keep your pressure on the back side and you roll towards it and you're essentially tracking again and this demonstration piece is um, not having a good time of it, but what you can see now is there's definitely starting to be a, uh, a curve. Now if you're worried about marking the metal, you might fit a rubber band. Uh, you can buy them, but um, we're not cheap, we're just thrifty. And I just made mine out of a um, tube from a tyre. Uh, and just stretch it over. I had a play with it earlier in the week. Uh, yes, it sort of works. So, right, there we go. This is the EWBT40 Hair and Forbes English Wheel. All in all, I'm pretty happy with this benchtop model. I think it will do exactly what I want it to do. It's all working well. I've had it for about a week and a bit now. Uh, put in some time rolling uh, some sheep and uh, seems to be working nicely. Probably the thing that I would change on it is I would go for a bigger knob on the adjuster for the anvil uh, just so that I can increase the pressure. But other than that I think it's quite good. There's no evidence of any deflection in the frame. I'm quite happy with that. Quite a good unit. I can just poke it in the corner when I'm not using it, so it's not taking up a lot of floor space, which, as I said in the beginning, is one of my issues. I just don't have enough. That brings us to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed the video. Look forward to talking to you in the next one. If you've got any comments or suggestions, your view, hit me up in the comments below. I always look at the comments and I always respond in one form or another. Uh, my channel's not that big that I can't, can't spend the time on uh, comments, so I do. Thanks very much again for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye!